I hope you've had a chance to listen to part one of this interview on BizBytes. Stay tuned now for part two. Welcome to BizBytes, brought to you by Com Together, helping businesses like yours build their brand through telling amazing stories to engage and grow audiences on multiple platforms. It, tell me how it began for you. Where where did this uh, idea of firstly becoming a mechanic come? Was that something that started in in school? Was it did it come from you know dad or someone? Where did it where did it come from? So my grandfather was a mechanical engineer and um, he was always fixing things, building things, repairing things. Uh, every car he bought, he would disassemble the engine and make his own adjustments to how he thought the engine should be and then rebuild it. Um, and my dad was always part of that, hanging around his dad, my grandfather. Uh, and so cars and mechanical things were, were, were pretty natural. Um, I was certainly the kid that had all the broken toys growing up because I knew how to take them apart, but I couldn't get them back together very <laughs> successfully. Um, there was a there was an, an opportunity um, at school to do work experience, and I had a choice between the carpentry workshop and a mechanical workshop. And uh, I took the mechanical workshop because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, it it was really that that thin. The, the the thinking between the two, um, and I loved it. I, I I pardon the expression, but I fell uh, butt backwards into a bed of roses. That was just absolutely my thing. I'd never had so much fun. I'd never had so much joy working with my hands, um, like greasy from the the tip of my head to the soles of my feet. Like my mum was horrified at what she had to try and clean off all the clothes that I was wearing. Like I just about had to get a new washing machine. It was that bad. But I was the proverbial pig in mud, absolutely, uh, and I've loved it ever since. And uh, so, I uh, going f going forward from there, um, I applied for a job just as on a whim. There was a uh, an ad in the newspaper, and uh, our careers person at school said, "Look, you know, on your school holidays, won't you apply for a job? You won't get them, but it's good experience." And so, uh, I took that to heart. I applied for a job as a technician. I was one of um, G 200 and something people that applied for 10 roles uh, and I got it um, and I figured that if, if if they were stupid enough to to invite me to come and work for them I'd be stupid enough to go and have a go right what's what's the worst that can happen I'll hate it and I'll have to go back to school and and, and that wasn't exactly a picture of joy me and school didn't get on so well together um, and uh, it was it was a match made in heaven so to speak and uh, I've been in it ever since I, I love that um you know, it's, it's it's amazing how many careers have started off in that particular fashion where you sort of, on a whim, you try something out. I know I, from, you know, personally, I uh, applied to do some work experience somewhere and kept coming back and I just basically stayed for, I think I did work experience seven days a week for over a year before they pulled me aside and said, um, you know, you can't keep doing work experience endlessly. And I said, well, I can until you give me a job. Two weeks later, they offered me a job. So, um, yeah, you know, you you do, I don't think that works anymore. I think uh, I think there are lots of rules and regulations that will stop that from happening today. <laughs> I think there might but, be some legislation around yeah, that. But, yeah, it just maybe. But, but you know, there's their the own uh, the the own versions. Everyone's got their own version of that sort of thing these days. Um, and so, so, tell me then, how did you make that step? Because obviously, along the way, I, I'm gathering that you had a few roles that you filled as a as a mechanic along the way. So. What started to get you itchy feet to say, there's a gap in the market and I can fill that gap? Yeah. So I, I was really fortunate to to work for an independent workshop initially. And it didn't matter if it had an engine, we'd have a go. I had a, a foreman who was a a, a, a UK gentleman, uh, a likely lad, uh, and, and very, very knowledgeable and it worked to really high standards. And so... Um, he he really was a, a very effective mentor, as was my boss. And it was like, you know, you, you're not here for your stunning visual. You're not here to play games. You're not here to to have fun. B by all means, have by all means have fun. But you're here to work. You're here to produce a result. Um, and as a result of that, I was held to a much higher standard, I think, than a lot of other technicians may may have been. Um, I moved from that job into the dealership world, which is a very different world, and that was that was a shock. You know, that's like going from a from a um, you know a, a volcanic pool into an ice pond, mm. you know it, it, it was it was a real shock for me, and I struggled at first just because of the the culture and the the, the difference in standards. Um, and 
working in the dealership was great because you got to work on all the really new stuff instead of things that were older and dirtier and and that sort of stuff. Um, but I got to a point of frustration, I guess, in in the business where I was solving a whole lot of problems, and there were a bunch of people that um, were creating the problems. Let let me be let me be frank. That they they uh, there's a a um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a saying that says uh, what gets measured gets managed. And what they measured was people's efficiency, their speed at which they could fix a car. And as a result of that, everything was about speed. It wasn't about quality. And and I was a quality person. And uh, there were some some profoundly unethical things. And I, I won't mention brands and uh, I certainly won't mention people, but there were some profoundly um, dangerous and unethical things that were done in the interest of getting a bonus. And it became all about money. And and when it becomes all about money, you rip the soul out of the, I believe you rip the soul out of the industry without any question. And and this is one of the drivers, I think, in this, the present skill shortage in automotive is it's all become about money. And, and don't get me wrong, it is about the money, but it's not just about the money. The money is important, but but so is all the other parts. But anyway, um, I, I, um, I ended up being a bit disillusioned, I guess, with the whole... Uh, industry in that like well you know if it's not about you know serving the customers if it's not about fixing the car if it's not about the thrill of the chase you know when you're trying to find a problem then why am I doing this and so I I got to the point where it was like well I don't want to give up uh, you know a decade uh, more than a decade of experience and just throw it away and become an accountant or a uh, you know whatever truck driver um I decided I would go into training. So I went and did a, a training uh, certificate and then some months later applied for a whole bunch of jobs around training with my qualification and uh, ended up uh, working for an international company doing uh, technical training based in Melbourne, but working through Southeast Asia. Um, and that's arguably one of the hardest things I've ever, ever had to do is trying to teach people who's uh, who have English as a, a second or a third or a fourth language in some cases, uh, profound technology that is on the cars um, in a language that they don't understand. So, uh, but profoundly rewarding, arguably the most uh, uh, rich and enjoyable job I've ever had. Coming out of that, Again, I got to a point of frustration where how is it that technician A can come along to a training class, go away with a bunch of knowledge, go back to their their workshop and be profoundly successful on cars? And technician B, who's got the same amount of, uh, of experience, the same amount of time in the industry, has done more or less the same amount of training, can go back into their workshop and they struggle. That They really are less successful than they ought to be. Why? What's going on there? And um, that that question, I think, haunted me for, I'm going to go on 10 years. Um, I moved out of training into working for a manufacturer, uh, being the, the, the lead trainer to running the training department for technical to running the training department for sales, service, parts, warranty, customer service, and everything. And that question still haunted me. How is it that tech A can be successful and tech B can't when the differences between the two are are negligible, if any? And part of the challenge was we didn't have a good way to test for that. Everyone had an idea. Everyone had a theory. And and the theories weren't wrong, but they were incomplete. So people would go, oh, it's their attitude. And, And absolutely, the attitude matters. People would go, oh, it's their experience. And absolutely, experience matters. But for every item that they they listed oh it's attitude experience it's it's it's, um it's training it's it's know-how it's it's practice it's it's all these other things that it is i could show you a different a dozen different examples of people who had that and who were still unsuccessful and so we didn't have a good method of being able to analyze what was really going on we couldn't get below the tip of the iceberg and uh it wasn't until um, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Marvin Oka, who you, you've probably never heard of, um, asked me if I'd like to participate in um, neurobehavioral modelling. Um, that I actually learnt the skill that allowed me to, if you like, stick my head below the water, surface of the water, below what the, the the obvious things were, and actually understand what was really happening, as opposed to what the narrative said or what the opinion said, or or all that sort of stuff, and to, to unpack uh, essentially uh, what is people's unconscious competence. They do it, but they can't explain how they do it. 
well, neurobehavioral modeling was the way uh, to actually go and strip back the, the the different levels and actually figure out what's really going on as opposed to what people think or say is going on. I love that. And that was a game changer it, for It's me. kind of, it's the... Uh... You're, you're the mechanic being the mechanic in in a sense in the in the industry because the you know here's an industry that is built around looking under the hood and yet they weren't really doing that to themselves and arguably still aren't um and you're able to do that and pull that apart and I think that's a an extraordinary skill to be able to do that and and um it's a it, it's it's a really interesting gap in the market that's developed as a result of all of that um I know we could talk for ages, and you and I have done for many, many, many hours uh, at times. Um, cool. I think we've killed a few hours on on some long meals uh, in the past uh, year or two alone. But I wanted to just wrap up by asking you one key question, um, and I think this is an important one, particularly in the space that you're in. What is it that you wish the CEOs, the the owners of these various businesses that you're targeting, would know? that they only find out once they've employed you after a period of time? What do you? What is it that they should know now that would put them in a better position? That's, gee, that's, a again, what a great question. And I, I probably need to go and sleep on it, but certainly off, off the top of my head, um, I, I think certainly the CEOs of dealerships and, and, and the owners of workshops and stuff um, have learnt um, a very conventional or traditional way of doing business. And and please let me say straight up, it's not wrong. Um, it is, however, perhaps incomplete or inaccurate. I'm not quite sure what the right way is. Um, when you look at any business, it's, it's worth looking at why the business exists. And so the reason a, a, a workshop exists is to fix cars essentially to service and repair cars and and really that if you dig below the surface that's about giving the the, the customer the owner uh confidence in their car for the next however period of time 12 months or whatever the service interval is that they can get into their car and it will start and it will run and, and it will get them to where they want to go and they can trust that their car will do that because they trust the mechanics that worked on the car and there's been a, uh, I don't know, a flip, a change in businesses where management has become the most important thing. And it's like, no, the business doesn't exist for management and it doesn't exist for customer service. The business exists to fix cars, which makes the technician the most important person in the business, like the most important person of the business. You vanish technicians out of a workshop. What have you got? No one's going to bring their car to you for great workshop management. No one's going to bring their car to you for excellent customer service because if the car's not working or it needs servicing, customer service isn't going to solve that problem. It's the skill and the ability of the technician uh, that's the difference that makes the difference in the business. And, and so if that's true, and this is what CEOs should know, if that's true, anything they can do to resource, to reward, or to recognize their technicians, to help them become engaged, to help them develop, uh, is going to be uh, a, a huge step towards massively improving their bottom line and towards keeping the technicians and keeping the skills in their business. So and so the business should be flipped instead of management is the pinnacle. No, 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 technicians at the pinnacle. Uh, and that's an entirely different way. Yeah, absolutely. I, and it's so... Um, endlessly fascinating to me because what you say is so true and yet it's so little is done about it and recognized and it's it's often that i think we've all experienced going to getting our car serviced and we're just another another car running through a you know and yeah, and number. and yep. there's no there's very little engagement um i um, had my car serviced a few months ago and at a different dealership to where I norm normally had in the past because I've moved. And I found the experience was really different and interesting because whilst they may not have gone to the full extent of which you're talking about, they did build the level of trust by um, keeping you informed during the, during the process. Because I, I, you know, rewind a few years ago where I had a, a, a you know, a well-established brand car and, you know, came to the end and said, that'll be X amount. And I went, 
but you did all these things. How, how do I even know? Like, I have no idea if you actually did them. And I didn't even know I wanted them right. or needed them. And yeah, to, right. to the other extent where this this point was, well, this is where we're up to in the process. Now, it's kind of like the the the, um, the the dominoes model um, where, you know, you've ordered your pizza and they're showing you photographs of the pizza being made and this is your pizza coming along the way and you get to track it with your, you know, Uber Eats or whoever it is that's driving it to your door. Yep. Um, and there's this level of trust that's being built up along the way. And particularly, at least with a pizza, we all understand what goes into a pizza and what, you know, what's going to make the pizza look good and, and hopefully taste good. But when it comes to, taste good. Yeah, when it comes to a car, we have no idea. We know when it works. We know when it's not working. Um, but that's usually about yep. the extent of it. And, and I'm going to argue this is why you want technicians who really care about what they do working on the car, because for them it's not about um, it's not about the money. They'll take the money. Don't get me wrong. And and can I say they're worth the money without question? But for them, it's the passion. It's I I get to solve this customer's concern. I get to work on cool technology. I get to do something that matters, that makes a difference in people's lives. Because if you've ever not had a car because it's broken down, you'll understand just how much uh, we rely on them. Like, what do you do when you don't have a car? Yeah, it's so, it's you know, I, absolutely. I I know how much um, you know. Certainly, our family relies on on the car that we have, and uh, it's critical that it runs effectively and efficiently. And um, you know, there's an expectation that it will. Our understanding of it of what's going on under the hood is almost zero. And I and I have to laugh when you go on a uh, you know a chat. Um, you know, there are various groups that I'm sure most cars um, have for their particular model of car. And uh, yep. the most common thing that I see on 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 the one that I have is all oh, the indicators are too loud. Okay, really? That's that's what you <laughs> that's what you're worried about. Like, I'm I've got a car that actually mechanically has been working beautifully, and I can't complain about it at all. The indicators are a little bit loud, as you say. There's millions of rows of code. Could they potentially fix it? Maybe. Is it high on the priority list of making that car run smoothly? No. And and I think people undervalue and underestimate what goes into making sure that this you know piece of equipment that we use day in day out works and works properly. Yeah. Yeah. Henry Ford once said um, that that cars were the greatest machine known to man. Uh, and I'm going to argue he's still right today. You know, like what, what we couldn't do um, without cars, you know, we think about transport, we think about all the things that rely on that. Uh, underpinning all that is some really good people, some really clever people. Um, and and some of them are more engaged than others with, without question. Um, but it's certainly our vision to see technicians uh, recognised and rewarded uh, and respected for the skill that they bring to the industry and just the impact that that has on on people's day-to-day -day lives, never mind the, the the bigger economy and all those sorts of things. You know, I, I was talking with a, a colleague the other day and we were comparing war stories um, and he made the statement, he goes, you know, I reckon I've saved more lives than the average ER doctor. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, for the number of cars that I have found uh, potentially life-threatening issues with over my career, and he'd been in the industry about the same amount of time that I have. He says it would it would be in the tens of thousands of of uh, of issues that he's gone. Hey, look, if you don't get this fixed, it'll kill you. And they had the customer had no idea. And with respect, the customer it shouldn't be expected to know that. Like that's that's the that's why you get your car service. That's the whole reason behind it. So I just thought that that was a very interesting distinction um, that he saw himself as someone who saved people's lives, and it's true. Absolutely, and I and I think there's a lot of lessons that people in all sorts of businesses can learn from this discussion because we all have our versions of mechanics in each of our own industries, sure. and um and and sometimes they are literally lifesavers. Other times, you know, the the it may not be a lifesaver in the true sense of what um, particular um, businesses do, but nonetheless can be super critical and playing a role in the importance of what oh, happens sure. in someone's day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, a pen, right. you know, getting a pen right and having that ball on the pen working correctly so that the ink's flowing through it uh, is important in the efficiency of running a business on a day-to-day -day basis. It may not be a life-threatening issue because 
Um, it's not in that realm, but it's nonetheless extremely important in making sure something is running effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we can underestimate the value that each of our businesses plays in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's an important lesson to really value that technical expertise, upskilling it and maintaining it and realising that that is the gold that separates one business from the next. Yeah, absolutely. Show me a business that doesn't want engaged people. Uh, show me a business that doesn't want to retain you know, quality skills in the business. I mean, that's the difference that makes the between a, a profitable business and a, and a business that struggles, right? Absolutely. Andrew, we better end it there or we're going to keep talking through about five episodes of, of, uh, of the podcast. Uh, but I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And I really thank you so much for, for, for your time uh, with this. And I, I, I really enjoyed the insights into what is an incredibly complex industry that probably most of us don't think all that much about. Yeah, look, Anthony, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to just be on the podcast and to, to, to share some of the stuff that we've come across. Uh, it's, it's been an absolute, uh, an absolute win. Thank you. And everyone stay tuned, of course, for the next episode of Biz Bites. Biz Bites is brought to you by Com Together for all your marketing needs so you can build your brand, engage audiences on multiple platforms. Go to comtogether.com.au Follow the links to book an appointment for a free consultation.